and with, with your tolerance, I thought I'd read a kind of short scene that introduces us to a character named Megan Gunther, who's a student at NYU, uh, who finds herself, um, well, you'll find out what happens to her. <laughs> uh, Megan Gunther rolled her fingertips lightly over the keyboard of her laptop computer. It was a nervous habit. If her typing fingers were positioned at the ready, she had a tendency to keep them moving, tiny little wiggles against the smooth black keys. She remembered begging her mother to teach her to type at the age of six. Her parents had just purchased a home computer, and Megan would eavesdrop as they sat side by side at her father's desk, marveling at the wonders on the screen, all attributable to something called the internet. But Megan had marveled at the speed of her mother's fingers as they flew across the keyboard. She glanced at the round white clock that hung above the blank blackboard behind Professor Ellen Stein. 11.45, 15 more minutes. 35 minutes of class had already passed and the only words on her laptop screen were life and death, followed by the date, followed by a single question. Are all lives equally good? <clears throat> Megan had enrolled in this seminar because the catalog description had piqued her curiosity. Is life inherently worthwhile or only if the life lived is a good life? Is death necessarily negative? Is a life not lived superior to a life lived in vain? Megan was no philosophy major. She would declare biology next year, and her curriculum was designed specifically for pre-med. But that course description had grabbed her attention. She figured that it could only serve the medical profession well if a future doctor took the time to contemplate the larger meaning of life and death, in addition to learning the science that could extend one and forestall the other. She should have foreseen, though, that a philosophy seminar with no prerequisites would devolve into a series of free-floating chat sessions during which unfocused undergrads, the ones who would eventually wind up behind a Starbucks counter or perhaps in law school, I'm a law school <laughs> <laughs> attempted to show off their mastery of the most reductionist versions of the various branches of philosophy. Today's class, as, as was often the case, had held momentary promise when Dr. Stein posed the question that was still staring at Megan from the screen of her laptop, are all lives equally good? Unfortunately, the first student to respond immediately played the Hitler card, as in, of course not, I mean, who here mourns the death of Hitler? After just three weeks of a single philosophy course, Megan was convinced that the quality of the national civic dialogue would be noticeably improved by a voluntary prohibition against all analogies to Nazi Germany. Poor Dr. Stein had done her best to steer the conversation on track, but then the girl who always wore overalls and patchouli oil had set off another frenzy of mental masturbation by wondering aloud whether the mentally disabled enjoyed their lives as much as quote unquote <coughs> regular people. Megan found herself contemplating her fingers jiggling on the keyboard again. Not her fingers as much as the keyboard itself, the layout. She understood why the Q and the Z belonged to the whim of her left pinky. Hitler analogies were more common than the use of those letters. But what criteria had been used to determine the keys that would qualify for home base, as her mother had called it during her early touch typing training? A, S, D, L, those she understood. But F and J and the semicolon? How often did anyone use semicolons? She turned to her, oops, skipped a page. She forced herself to tune back into the conversation around the seminar table. She gathered that the patchouli girl's comment about the mentally disabled had set off a larger conversation about the value of knowledge when a guy with a paperboy hat and a beatnik soul patch retorted, of much more questionable value is a life spent absorbing knowledge, but then doing absolutely nothing with it. At that, Megan thought she noticed a twitch in Dr. Stein's left eye. Twenty minutes later, the ca class was still debating whether knowledge was worthy for its own sake or merely as a means towards practical ends. This might be slightly off topic. Megan felt her eyes rolling involuntarily away from the speaker, the decent looking guy who always wore concert t-shirts. This might be slightly off topic, but has anyone else wondered why John Locke on Lost is named John Locke? It explains the inconsistencies in the various narratives. The writers are telling us to take all those flashbacks and flash forwards with a grain of salt. They're each filtered through the lens of the character's personal experiences. Oh my God, did he really just say that? The whisper came from the student sitting next to Megan, a guy in a Philadelphia Flyers jersey with a serious case of bedhead. I should have saved my trust fund and gone to Penn. <laughs> okay, people, time out. Stein wrapped her knuckles against the tabletop to call the class to order. Let's get back to the original question. 
Megan wished she had a dollar for every time Dr. Stein had taken them back to the original question. The woman no doubt knew her stuff, but she had to stop treating these morons as intellectual equals. If this group could be trusted with the amount of guidance provided by the original question, they wouldn't be talking about Hitler the mentally disabled and a television show about island castaways. She finally caved to temptation and opened Internet Explorer on her laptop. <clears throat> Almost all of the university's buildings were equipped with wireless Internet access, but a serious professor like Dr. Steins certainly expected her students to refrain from partaking during class time. Barely veiled surfing ran rampant, however, and to Megan it was no surprise. The university's current regime was, in her view, no different from cutting lines of cocaine on the desktop in front of addicts and telling them not to snort. She moved her right hand onto the laptop's mouse pad and checked her Gmail account while making a point of periodically looking up from her screen to deliver a pensive nod. From there, it was on to Perez Hilton's site for the go celebrity gossip, then to Facebook, where it was her turn in the Scrabble game she was playing with Courtney. Megan noticed that her neighbor with the bedhead was eyeballing her computer screen. She was about to deliver her best warning glare when he nudged his notebook an inch in her direction. Beneath a series of doodled boxes and circles, he had jotted, you missed hayseed for a bingo. She turned to her game and confirmed the mistake. Switching the laptop back to her blank class notes, she typed a sad face, a colon followed by a dash and a left parenthesis. Her neighbor scribbled another note, campusjuice.com. Megan clicked back to her browser, typed the website name into the address bar, and gently hit the enter key, Campus Juice. White bubble letters against an orange background followed by a slogan that said it all. All the juice, always anonymous. In the middle of the screen was a text box labeled Choose Your Campus. Megan typed in NYU and hit enter. Up came a message board consisting of a list of posts, each with its own subject title. Craziest person in your dorm. WTF, did Brandon Salzburg drop out? Freshman 15, plus another 15. Who's sluttier, Kelly Gottlieb or Jenny Huntsman? Hottest professors. I've got a sex tape. Michael Stewart gave me the clap. Megan dropped her right hand beneath the seminar table and flashed a thumbs up at her neighbor, who doodled an excl exclamation point in the margin of his notebook. She clicked on the link to pull up the thread concerning Michael Stewart and his supposed STD. The message had been posted an hour earlier, and already two people had responded, one alleging that Stewart lived in her dorm and was a rampant meth fiend, the other, complaint, the other claiming to be Michael Stewart himself with some not-so-kind words about the original poster's cottage cheese thighs. <laughs> Megan scrolled through the next three pages of posts. The entire site was, divided, was devoted to on-campus gossip, insults, and attacks, all naming real names, and yet capable of being posted with complete anonymity if the author so, choose, so chose. She had just finished perusing one of the more respectable threads, speculation about the identity of this year's commencement speaker, when the title of another post grabbed her attention. She stared at the two words on the screen, Megan Gunther. Moving the cursor to the hyperlink, she could not bring herself to click on the text. Something inside of her, whatever instincts humans possess for emotional self-preservation, told her that one click would change everything. She didn't want to read whatever had been written there for the entire world to see. Megan jerked at the sound of a book being dropped on the table. She looked up to see Ellen Stein's eyes directed at her, along with 19 younger conspiratorial faces smirking at her embarrassment. I'm sorry, Miss Gunther, are we interrupting your computer research? So you have to read the book to find out what was actually written. <laughs>